time travel. It is possible, according to two of the 20th century's greatest scientific minds, Albert Einstein, whose famous equations did nothing to preclude the possibility of time travel, and Dr. Emmett Brown, inventor of the flux capacitor. The big difference? Einstein's time machine only goes in one direction and is supported by mounds of scientific evidence. We know from special relativity and general relativity that time travel is absolutely possible. Time travel to the future. If you traveled to a nearby star at a sizable fraction of the speed of light and came back, you would find that people on Earth have aged a lot more than you have. Relativity actually allows time travel forward. Buck Rogers in the 25th century got it right, Andromeda got it right. Doc Brown's time machine goes both forward and backward in time. And according to the laws of physics, that's a no-no. Or is it? Traveling into the past doesn't seem to violate any fundamental laws of physics. And in fact, there are some schemes that physicists have talked about that seem to provide an opportunity to travel into the past. Traveling in a certain way around the black hole might do it. Wormholes could conceivably be converted into time machines. If you take one end of a wormhole, accelerate it to close to the speed of light, send it out many hundreds of light years, then bring it back to close to where you started, well, that end of the wormhole exists permanently in the past of the other end. So presumably, by flying through the wormhole, you can travel into the past. Sounds simple. But scientists say there's no known way to stabilize the energy field that would make up such a wormhole. And another problem. Travel to the past, and you risk causing a paradox. The grandfather paradox in time travel is that you go back in time and kill your grandfather before your mother or father was born. And this then means that you couldn't have possibly come into existence. But then how could you have gone back in time and killed your grandfather? It's a logical paradox. Other people have said, well, you know, maybe there's a way around this problem. There is a way of looking at quantum mechanics called the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics. One of the many interpretations of quantum mechanics says that every time a decision is made, the universe splits. Every time I send a photon of light through a slit and it goes in one direction, there's another universe where it goes in another direction. Every time I spill my coffee in this universe, there's another universe where my coffee remains safe. According to this many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, anything that could have been has happened somewhere, and anything that can be, will, will be, be somewhere, somewhere in the multiverse. And so there are literally countless universes splitting off from our own every second of every day of every year. And if that's the case, then people argue that, well, traveling back in time, you could go back and kill your grandfather, and you'd still be alive. Well, how is that? Well, you just traveled into a different universe. If time travel is possible, one thing is certain. It's going to take a lot of energy. In Back to the Future, Doc achieves time travel when he gets his DeLorean powered up with 1.21 gigawatts and achieves a speed of 88 miles per hour. That's all just complete fantasy. The actual energy required for travel backwards in time, that is travel faster than the speed of light, is infinite or even more than infinite from what we can tell, or requires some sort of a wormhole or other passage shortcut through the universe. 1.21 gigawatts just isn't gonna do it. 88 miles an hour just isn't gonna do it. Sometimes movie science trumps science science. What is a flux capacitor and how does it work? <laughs> you know, I have no idea whatsoever. The Back to the Future trilogy also shows flying cars speeding down aerial highways in the now not so far off year of 2015. Many tales of science fiction miss the mark when it comes to predicting the future. 
One of the amazing things about going back and looking at old sci-fi is people never really imagined how integral a part of our lives computers would become. How all of us would have our own handheld devices, our own laptops, our own desktops. And everything we do would, in many ways, be mediated through the technology. Even small children now have their own laptops in many cases. And you don't see this in the sci-fi. But in other ways, the distinctions between the worlds of science fiction and science fact are becoming more and more blurred with each passing year. After all, Kirk and Spock aren't the only ones with a pocket-sized communications device that can connect you with anyone else on the planet. Bormanis to Grazer, Bormanis to Grazer, come in. Under the topic of communications technology, excuse me. Not now, Andre, I'm busy. <laughs> communications is a place where science has outpaced science fiction. The cell phone that flip open like the original communicator actually have more options than the communicator did. I mean, did you ever see Mr. Spock playing Tetris? Did you ever see Captain Kirk interrupted by a text message? No. Science trumps science fiction. Who'd have thought it? What seemed miraculous 40 years ago is carried around in our pockets today. Science fiction is the dreaming side of science. It's the imagination, but you can't have science itself without imagination. Science needs inspiration. It needs that eureka moment, that aha. And I think science fiction helps create those moments for scientists. With each passing decade, creators of fantastic tales of the future push the imagination further. Because man will always wonder about tomorrow, even after it arrives. A paradox befitting the intertwined worlds of science fiction and science fact.